Buongiorno a tutte e a tutti, con grandissimo piacere introduco eh, il libro Psicoterapia della psicosi, integrare la prospettiva cognitiva e dinamica e dunque il suo autore, l'amico e collega Michael Garrett. Hi Michael. Michael Garrett è docente di psichiatria ed è direttore della Psychotherapy Education presso il Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences della SUNY Downstate Medical Center con sede a Brooklyn. Uh, questo libro fin dal titolo si rivela estremamente interessante e stimolante proprio perché tiene insieme due grandi tematiche. Una è quella della psicoterapia delle psicosi e l'altra è il tema dell'integrazione di due approcci eh, al fine di eh, ottenere diciamo, il massimo dell'efficacia e della praticabilità e dunque anche del vantaggio del paziente. Eh, vorrei iniziare a, a fare alcune domande a, a Michael, eh, passerò quindi alla forma inglese e poi eh, alla fine di questo, di questo breve colloquio allegheremo un testo scritto dove più domande e con risposte più articolate verranno rese disponibili per chi sarà interessato ad approfondire eh, l'argomento e naturalmente insomma ci auguriamo anche ad acquistare il libro. So Michael, my first question is that, is this one. In your book you use the term ambitious psychotherapy. I consider the adjective ambitious as an attempt to challenge a widespread therapeutic nihilism, let's say nihilism regarding psychosocial treatments for psychosis spectrum disorders. And as you discuss in your book, this attitude has led most clinicians, mental health professionals and policymakers to believe that schizophrenia First is fundamentally a chronic brain disease for which we have yet to find the biological cure. And secondly, psychotherapy for psychosis is uh, of no value and should be rejected as a treatment uh, modality. Mm, my question are whether and how this pervasive uh, pessimism has been uh, disproved by scientific evidence. What are the historical, the clinical, political, and financial reasons uh, you think uh, underlie this uh, pessimistic attitude? And uh, what are the consequences uh, for uh, so many patients suffering from uh, psychosis who receive uh, treatment as usual for their condition? Uh, first of all, I, I would like to thank you, Vittorio, for your uh, interest in my book. And uh, if, if I were to choose one language to have the book translated in, it would be uh, Italian. Uh, I love Italy. Uh, if, I, uh, if I had the, in my second life, I'm going to live in Rome. Uh, the, the history and the light there is uh, fantastic. So uh, it's, it's a delight to think of the book, you know, being translated. So um, as you know, that's a complicated question <clears throat> you, you ask. Um, To start with the idea of um, therapeutic nihilism and, and pessimism, one of the things that happens in psychiatry is that uh, compared with other branches of medicine, which have made dramatic advances, uh, the treatment of stroke and cancer and all kinds of conditions, psychiatry has lagged way behind in that. Uh, and so when psychiatrists don't get um, real uh, solid outcomes of recovery. The explanation for that is it's generally blamed on the disease rather than on the inadequacy of treatments. And this didn't happen in other branches of medicine. Uh, in other branches of medicine, uh, the doctors would regroup researchers and say, okay, we don't, we don't know how to treat this yet, but it's not blamed on the disease. So this nihilism has a profound effect both uh, on the clinical front line and in research funding. Uh, so people are, uh, I think uh, the research community is kind of waiting for the biological messiah to arrive uh, and solve the problem. But I was uh, uh, not surprised, but still somewhat shocked. Uh, Thomas Insel, who was the uh, director of the NIMH uh, for almost a decade, uh, Some years ago, uh, he was uh, quoted in, in an interview 
saying that of the billions of dollars that had been designated for biological research, uh, as he put it, it hadn't moved the needle very much at all in terms of clinical frontline uh, changes. And also uh, there was a recent review uh, by a panel of the most prominent neuroscientists publishing in neuroscience literature, Carl Friston among uh, other them, uh, Frith, um, Fletcher, uh, where uh, they also come to the same conclusion that very little advance uh, has happened as a result of basic research. So the question is, do we have to wait for biology to give us something to use or do we already have tools that, that we're not fully uh, utilizing? And, and I think that's the case. Uh, we, we have tools that can help people. Not everybody, psychotherapy is not a panacea for uh, this condition, uh, but there are folks who'd be doing much better than they are uh, if they had the opportunity for psychotherapy. So how did this come about? Um, as everybody knows, in the 1950s, there was a dramatic change uh, in the treatment of acute psychosis with the advent of neuroleptic drugs, uh, the first being Thorazine. And it was like a miracle. It was dramatic. Uh, people who would come in uh, floridly uh, psychotic, uh, two or three weeks later, they will have calmed down and gotten organized uh, and were able to be discharged. So this undoubtedly was a tremendous step forward. However, it wasn't known at that time, uh, the chronic side effects of these medications. Uh, and uh, so this initial therapeutic uh, enthusiasm quieted a bit, uh, but it didn't take a turn toward, <clears throat> biopsych toward psychosocial treatments. Uh, it remained uh, in the biological arena. The same thing that was happening uh, at that time was that uh, in the 1950s, psychoanalysts were typically the chairman of academic psychiatry departments. That's not the case anymore. Uh, analysts barely have positions in you know, academic psychiatry. So at the same time that biology was making an advance, uh, uh, psychoanalysis had made an overreach. Uh, there was a certain kind of arrogance, I think, with the idea that uh, being such a deep uh, treatment uh, that uh, it could be applied unaltered you know, to uh, psychotic conditions. So the combination of these two, an overreach of psychoanalysis and the reach of biological treatments uh, for the past uh, 70 years, um, interest in the psychology of psychosis has uh, uh, been undermined. Another unfortunate thing that happened uh, is that um, there was uh, a, uh, a book by May, uh, a big research study, which was very poorly designed. Uh, it basically had psychoanalysts who had no uh, extensive experience treating psychosis with uh, very junior trainees treating psychotic patients and they compared psychotherapy with psychotherapy with medication and found that the psychotherapy wasn't particularly efficacious. And that study was basically the equivalent of um, taking uh, first year medical interns and inviting them to do brain surgery. And <laughs> you, you, you don't get very good results you know, if people aren't adequately trained. So this became part of the myth of the psychotherapy of psychosis. That study, and not surprising, the drug companies they funded the purchase of that book to be distributed widely to American psychiatrists. So that became kind of the Bible. Then there was another often quoted study uh, of a patient uh, who was put on the couch uh, and had, uh, according to the authors, even though they never saw the patient, uh, a bad outcome. And that led to another kind of misconception that psychotherapy can be damaging to psychotic people. So you combine all of these things uh, and uh, psychotherapy is just barely holding on, you know, in, in recent decades. So I think of psychotherapy as being uh, in its infancy. Uh, and uh, so something is known, but much more needs to be known. Uh, and we have a beginning, uh, but if there isn't an investment in this kind of treatment, you can't build a critical mass of clinicians and researchers. It has to be funded to refine techniques to get better outcomes with people. There is some evidence, uh, research evidence. The strongest evidence is for CBT for psychosis, which is something that I underscore in my book. Yeah. 
And um, there have been uh, somewhere in the neighborhood now, I think of uh, 40 double blind controlled trials that show positive outcomes for CBT for psychosis, mm -hmm. including some patients who are unresponsive to medication. So you can get an additional benefit sometimes with psychotherapy. But the effect sizes in these studies are small to moderate, uh, which also is not surprising given the, uh, the difficulty of the condition. Also, um, I'm not a researcher, I'm a clinician, uh, but um, to do research, uh, a, a study uh, of 12 to 20 sessions of CBT is something that a grant funder might uh, fund, but a 10 year follow-up study you know, or <laughs> five years of uh, weekly psychotherapy, I don't think so. Nobody pays for that kind of research. So what we get is what's called uh, uh, evidence-based practice, uh, but th th there's not enough of practice-based evidence. And so what happened is that research protocols for CBT for psychosis got exported into the clinical community. Yeah. Those are research protocols. Those are not things uh, you know, that really capture uh, the necessities of frontline clinical work. So listen, uh, Michael, let's go to the, the really innovative aspect of your book, speaking of psychotherapy, because uh, your proposal, as we said, uh, is that an ambitious psychotherapy is a technique that integrates uh, CBT with uh, psychodynamic approaches. And so an integration also rooted in your uh, model of a compelling synthesis between uh, both biological and psychological theories of psychosis. But uh, um, from a clinical point of view, let's, uh, let's uh, wait for a mo moment to talk about uh, research. Why should CBT and psychodynamic approaches be integrated uh, and uh, what are their limitations in the therapy of psychosis if used separately? Mm -hmm. um, any model of psychotherapy should be, or any practice of psychotherapy should be based on a model uh, so, so that your practice should follow your conceptualization of the condition. So the way I conceptualize psychosis, not just me, but people who are like-minded, is that um, there are two defining characteristics of psychosis uh, or, or what is diagnosed as schizophrenia. One of them is a peculiar merger of emotion, meaning, and perception. And this concept has been around for uh, uh, you know, a millennium, uh, the idea of uh, a delusional perception, uh, or more recently it's called thing presentations of mental life. And the idea is that uh, in a typical symptom, like an idea of reference where the patient might say, I got on the bus and I could tell by the way the bus driver looked at me that he was in on a secret plot and he knew private information about me. What happens there is that the meaning of that is embedded in the perception. They're the same thing. The, pe the person doesn't say, oh, the bus driver's looking at me. Why might he be doing that? Or the way most of us would do, we wouldn't even notice it. We wouldn't even care. So that's one characteristic of psychosis uh, that you don't see in other uh, psychological conditions, this fusion of perception and meaning. And your technique has to be uh, oriented to dealing with that. The second is changes in the experience of the self, uh, which are described as uh, hyper-reflexive self-awareness uh, and a diminished ipsaity of the person. And these changes don't occur in DID uh, or other, other kinds of dissociative disorders. So your technique has to be cued to address these two things. Now, the reason I think that a combination of CBT and psychodynamic work uh, is, uh, fits this model is that even though uh, the psychosis in many people is based on traumatic experiences that they've had in their life, they're real, things really happen to them. They project the memories of those into persecutors in the outside world. So in this case, in the case of that kind of delusion, the person thinks their problem is in the outside world. They don't think their problem is memories and the residual of adverse life experience. 
They think their problem is in the outside world. So CBT is a superior method to chip away, to raise questions about, uh, let's think together, uh, how adequate is that explanation? Does it really fit the facts? And then if you're successful in using CBT techniques uh, to get the patient interested in questioning their delusion, then you can say, might there be an alternative explanation for your experience? And that opens the door to a psychodynamic explanation for the person's experience. So obviously uh, there are uh, skilled CBT clinicians who are aware of psychodynamic factors and their psychodynamic cl uh, clinicians use CBT techniques. But in general, I think historically uh, psychodynamic clinicians pay too much attention too early to the unconscious meaning of symptoms. Uh, and uh, they don't develop the field slowly uh, enough to really make the, the treatment successful. And CBT clinicians, uh, they pay attention to the conscious perceived experience of the psychosis, uh, but uh, they stop short of really a full explanation. Uh, the patient understands that they've made an error uh, but uh, it remains to be seen why they made the particular error that they did. So the combination of these two, which roughly corresponds to Freud's idea of uh, primary process and secondary process. Secondary process and CBT helps you think logically about the symptom and CBT techniques are uh, excellent for doing that. And then uh, primary process, psychodynamic thinking uh, helps you think about the symbols the meanings that are made in the psychosis. Well, the reference you made uh, to the diminished ipsity, let's say a basic self disorder, uh, make me think that uh, the phenomenological theories are uh, just as important as the psychodynamic and the CBT ones. So once again, it seems that uh, your uh, uh, indication, your idea of a psychotherapist for psychosis is someone that uh, has a sort of eclectic training uh, and uh, able to merge uh, without con con confusing uh, different uh, models and different attitudes, different therapeutic attitudes. So can you uh, tell something to the Italian psychotherapist and to the Italian psychiatrist in th this direction. Think that I think that your book will be um, read by and studied by students and clinicians interested in uh, psychotherapy and treatment for psychosis. Uh, tell something to the Italian audience, uh, maybe from this point of view of the necessity of uh, eclectism and. Uh, uh, proposing different approaches in this field? Mm -hmm. um, I couldn't have said it better. <laughs> 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 yes, I think uh, a, a, an eclectic approach is, is actually necessary. And because uh, of the uh, infinite possibilities for rationalizing failure, uh, people get locked into guild approaches. And then if it doesn't, it's not successful, they don't think, well, maybe I need to train more broadly. The person just thinks, well, you know, it's the disease. I, I gave it a try. But no, it's not infinitely complicated. Uh, earnest clinicians can, uh, you know, learn all of these perspectives and apply them fluently. But yes, you have to get away from a guild, a narrow guild identification uh, to be effective with the patient. And I think uh, the phenomenological aspects of psychosis, the subjective experience of psychosis, which I write about in the book uh, and which others have uh, uh, written about um, is an often neglected aspect of uh, the clinical situation. To give you an example, uh, I worked with a patient uh, some years ago, a young man, uh, he was 19 and he was um, uh, like many people his age, uh, he, he was uh, uh, having sexual fantasies about people at school. Uh, he would uh, watch some pornography on his uh, computer, sort of normal developmental things, but he felt that he had a, uh, a voice that he named Psycho Girl, uh, who was observing his thoughts. And he was terrified of Psycho Girl because Psycho Girl uh, would repeat his thoughts verbatim exactly, never making a mistake. This was terrifying 
because he felt he had no privacy. Sorry. There was, he had no privacy. There was no way uh, for him to have uh, a private intimate thought about anything because Psycho Girl could read his mind. And a phenomenological uh, explanation uh, uh, accounts for this very easily. This is the experience of hyper-reflexive self-awareness where he's observing his own thoughts. The thoughts are echoing in his head uh, and he takes this, he personifies that process as the observation of an outside entity. So uh, a phenomenological understanding uh, can help the clinician to not be puzzled by things like this. Uh, and it actually opens up practical opportunities for working with the patient. And uh, this man uh, was smart uh, and he eventually did well in therapy because he noticed that uh, Psycho Girl did not appear when he was paying attention to something else that he was interested in. So he said, ah, oh, this has something to do with my attentional processes. Uh, and that diminished the power of Psycho Girl uh, immediately. And that line of thinking is guided by a phenomenological approach. So yes, therapists need to know something about the phenomenology of psychosis in order to understand you know, what the patient's going through. Yeah. So one last question. Um... According to your uh, model, uh, and also according to your experience uh, in your work in Brooklyn, but uh, uh, more in general in your country, uh, how is the cooperation of uh, the psychiatrist figure and the clinical psychologist? Uh, do you have experience of uh, uh, matching of experience, a real collaboration, or uh, do you think this uh, a model is more for an eclectic psychiatrist without uh, the, uh, the the collaboration uh, and the and the cooperation of a more psychological uh, professional. Yeah. Uh, I'm sure it varies in Italy as it does in the United States, but in general, uh, psychiatrists are in charge of psychiatric services, uh, and they're not well trained in the psychotherapy of psychosis. So I think that uh, in terms of um, who are going to be the therapists for these patients, it's probably not psychiatrists. Uh, it's going to be psychologists, social workers, nurses, uh, other uh, branches of, uh, in healthcare, um, drama therapists. Uh, those are the people I think that are best positioned to actually do the therapy. But what the doctors have to do is they have to welcome psychotherapy to the table. They have to appreciate it so that when you're having uh, treatment rounds, one needs to turn to the psychotherapist and ask earnestly and seriously, so what's happening in the psychotherapy? How are you uh, accomplishing things? And as I said before, I'm a clinician and not a researcher, but some years ago, uh, I did a, a chart review study of 50 inpatient charts. And I was curious how much biological information, social information, and psychological information was in the discharge summary. In other words, how much was learned from the inpatient admission that would be forwarded to frontline people after taking care of the patient. The biological information was pretty good so that you knew what meds the patient had been on, mm -hmm. but it may not surprise you, there was uh, almost no psychological information in the discharge summary. So this is a condition where, uh, because psychiatry and uh, the psychiatrists dominate the flow of information, there's no sense of progress. So the psychotherapists are starting all over again without benefit of what happened you know, in the treatment before. So um, the, <laughs> to put it one way, the doctors have to uh, create a field and get out of the way so the psychologists can save the, uh, you know, save the patients uh, because there's a lot of reasons that they don't have the time or the training you know, to really do this kind of uh, work. And the need is great. There's been a specific emphasis in the United States or uh, estimate in the United States that we have about 0.5% of the capacity uh, that's needed uh, to really provide this care to everybody who needs it. So uh, there's a lot of work to be done. Oh. So thank you, thank you, Michael, for this. That's a very interesting uh, conversation for your beautiful book. Uh, 
we hope that the Italian uh, psychiatrists and clinical psychologists will be interested in uh, studying it. Uh, and uh, we hope to have you in Italy very soon for a live presentation, no more uh, screen by screen, but uh, talking uh, in, a, in a workshop or talking in a conference uh, about uh, your uh, model of uh, psychotherapy for psychosis, uh, integrating psychodynamic and cognitive uh, uh, and also phenomenological approaches. So see you soon, Michael, and thank you thank very you. much. Thank, thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 <clears throat>